We are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAN for short. Hello, welcome to the Papers podcast series for the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. I'm Jo Carlo, a freelance journalist with a specialism in psychology. In this series, we speak to authors of papers published in one of ACAM's three journals. These are the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry, commonly known as JCPP, the Child and Adolescent Mental Health, known as CAM, and JCPP Advances. Today, I'm interviewing Professor Kirsten von Plessen, of the Department of Psychiatry at University Hospital, Lausanne, Switzerland. Kirsten is a joint author of the paper, Performing Well But Not Appreciating It, a trait feature of anorexia nervosa, recently published in JCPP Advances. This paper will be the focus of today's podcast. If you're a fan of our paper's podcast series, please subscribe on your preferred streaming platform. Let us know how we did with a rating or review and do share with friends and colleagues. Kirsten, thank you for joining me. Welcome. Can you start with an introduction about who you are and what you do? Hello, and thank you for having me. As you said, uh, I'm a professor of child and adolescent psychiatry at the University Hospital of Lausanne, and I'm also heading the division of child and adolescent psychiatry here in Lausanne. And before that, I was a professor in Copenhagen, and that's also where we performed this study together with Tina schupli jerissen and all other colleagues uh, from Copenhagen University. Thank you very much. So we're going to look at your paper today. This is Performing Well But Not Appreciating It, a trait feature of anorexia nervosa, recently published in JCPP Advances. Can you give us an overview of the paper to set the scene? So we compared a group of 33 adolescent girls um, during their first episode of anorexia nervosa, and we had 29 female controls of the same age, so they were all 16 years. And then we were able to recruit 23 adolescent girls who had recovered from anorexia nervosa, and they had the age of 18 years, and we had 23 female controls uh, that were obviously also at the age of 18. And we didn't exclude comorbidities in the uh, group of children or of of young girls with anorexia nervosa because we said, well, it's important also to keep uh, the comorbidities because they are often um, really present in our clinic. The only thing we did was to exclude uh, those who had an autism spectrum disorder because um, that would really also change the appreciation of your performance if you have an uh, autism spectrum disorder. And then uh, we asked them to perform this go no go task, quite a simple uh, performance task, where we also put in a difficulty. Um, So we had a rule shifting paradigm. That means that we show them three stimuli, but the significance of the stimuli of two of the three stimuli changed during the blocks that we had. So we had 28 blocks in total. So we had two sessions and each session consisted of 14 blocks. And then we also interfered uh, one on the other with rule shifting in between to make it a bit, little bit more difficult for them. And we also had blocks where um, the, the stimuli were not as easy to read as in other blocks. So we really had some features that made this task a little bit difficult. And that could also have contributed to their evaluation. So after each block, they had this evaluation, a self-evaluation on a continuous scale from poor to perfect. So it was really a visual analog scale. And they could position themselves in this scale. And they had to do it after each block. And then afterwards, we had a composite score of the performance, including the reaction time and also the error rate. And on the other hand, we could put that in relationship to their evaluation. At first, we had been thinking about uh, recruiting young girls before the onset of anorexia nervosa, but uh, we, we figured out that, that this would be a very difficult study to perform. And that's why we said, well, um, if we could have a recovered group, we would have this trait also examined. So that was the outset for this study. And in this study, we could show in a behavioral paradigm, and I think that's the, the most novel feature of this paper, And of this study, we could really show um, that, yes, in a behavioral paradigm, those girls in both groups, those who had an anorexia ongoing and those who had recovered from it, they were more critical towards their uh, performance than the control groups. 
Thank you. Just taking a step back, what is currently known about the relationship between perfectionism and anorexia and the boson? I mean, uh, perfectionism is really uh, very much associated also to low self-esteem, to ne negative self-concept, and to also some something you would call for clinical perfectionism. So that meaning uh, that in anorexia nervosa, um, you have often this characteristic that um, you strive for weight loss, you strive for an appearance, which is a form of a clinical perfectionism. And that has been identified quite clearly uh, in terms of risk factor for onset, but also a factor for also relapse in anorexia nervosa. Because we know that it's a risk factor for um, all kinds of um, anorexia nervosa or, or all states of anorexia nervosa, it's clear that it would be a very interesting factor also to include it in an individualized treatment. So far um, in the child and lessons um, literature, there are few studies who have included it and have targeted it. But there's one study I just wanted to highlight from Australia who actually included a CBT module for perfectionism uh, in an FBT approach, so family-based treatment approach that is the most known, the most evidence-based approach for young people with anorexia nervosa. And actually, they showed um, good results in their study. It was quite a small study, but it, it seems that there's really an interest to pursue for anorexia nervosa and perfectionism also in terms of treatment approaches. It's really interesting. And returning to your study, so, so perfectionism has been studied predominantly by the use of self-report questionnaires. Your study offers a novel behavioural method for measuring perfectionism. Kirsten, can you describe the method and explain why it was important to look beyond just self-evaluation reports? What is imp was important for us is also that we uh, wanted to use neutral stimuli. So we didn't want to use uh, stimuli that were um, associated to eating or emotions. So we really um, tried to find a cognitive paradigm. And that was a simple go no go task. I think most people know these tasks. You get to see stimuli and then uh, either you have to press the go button or the no go, <laughs> go button. And then you would measure um, reaction time and you would uh, also measure error, um, so commission mm -hmm. errors, where you would press when you're supposed not to press. And with that paradigm, we had quite a basic measure of a performance task. And then we ask the young girls or the not so young girls, because in the recovered um, group, they were 18 years old. And in the onset group, they were 16 years old in mean age. Um, and we asked them to evaluate how they did in, in this task. And we did this 28 times per person because we had 14 blocks twice. And so really after each block, they were uh, supposed on a scale to indicate uh, how they were doing. And based on these measures, we could um, have a composite of the performance score and also of the evaluation that they had. If you, if you go back to perfectionism, I would say um, it's really a measure of perfectionism, um, which is very self-oriented. As you probably know, um, there has been a lot of discussion the last years about perfectionism, and you should also try to distinguish self-oriented perfectionism and socially prescribed perfectionism. And here we really put forward a self-oriented perfectionism. I think that's important to stress also for this, um, for this study. And can you say anything more about why it was so important to look beyond just self-evaluation reports or, or, or what makes self-evaluation reports more limited or so limited? Well, I, I think it's really um, uh, it's a more objective measure. And it's also something you could um, think of introducing into the clinics because uh, this is really quite convincing. If I have done my test myself and then afterwards I see, well, I actually I evaluated myself much worse than other people who did the same test. That's something to share. Uh, and that's really something to also to have some learn uh, experience for the people 
Whereas, um, really, if you have a self report on, on perfectionism, difficult to say, well, probably you're more negative than other people. Have you thought about this? Then you would say, well, <laughs> actually, I'm not better than other people. Or I'm worse than other people. It's more difficult to discuss this uh, than to really have um, an objective measure. And also, um, it was important for us to, to be able to show that, that um, this is a group wh which actually um, objectively has a lower self-evaluation mm -hmm. uh, than their peers. Thank you. Um, is there anything more you want to say about the methodology? Just also concerning the results to stress that the younger group, so the group with the ongoing anorexia nervosa did yes. as well as they did the control group and the recovered group they did better than the control group and that was somehow a bit astonishing to us because um, mm. some, somehow the adult literature often showed that there was rather a slower reaction time in the anorexia group and so we can state that uh, that was not the case so it's interesting mm. that means that trying to distinguish uh, really chronic effects more from pathological effects. So I'm um, trying to say, well, the anorexia itself does not make that you're not performing as well. Mm -hmm. Then in a second um, step, that's also one of the limitations, of course, when we had the recovered group, the, those were girls who had rather early onset of their anorexia nervosa. And we could also see in the recovered group compared to the now onset group, mm -hmm. they had had earlier onset uh, and they had been recovered until the age of 18 when we saw them uh, in our study. So probably it was um, somehow a selected group that did better and who had a good um, recovery. So that's one of the limitations. But still, it's interesting to see that actually their performance was as good or superior uh, to the control group. Um, can we, we focus on something you mentioned earlier in, mm -hmm. in the findings? So this so this was the fact that you've just mentioned that despite being recovered from anorexia nervosa, recovered participants in your study evaluated their performances significantly more negatively than their respective controls, talking about the recovered group here. I'm wondering what the implications are of that finding. One of the implications clearly is that perfectionism is not only associated to illness. So it does not mean that it only concerns everything that, that is around eating about appearance, but that's something that seems to, to be somehow trans life for um, those young girls. That means that they are really evaluating whatever they do uh, in a way that is more negative than their peers. And I think that's quite an important point to put forward for also the approach to eating disorder. Does, does it imply that on some level they have not fully recovered? Exactly. So um, it, it may imply that they have not really recovered totally from an illness. But the question is, can you uh, recover in your life from something like an eating disorder? Because if you think that maybe this perfectionism is a trait, a feature that has also been there already before the onset of the anorexia nervosa, then in this case, probably you will always somehow stay with this. But it's clear that in order to be also protected for relapse in the future, it might be very important to address this feature and to say, well, what can we do in order to help you um, get resilient for just this risk that we can see here? Right. That brings me on to my next question, which is what are the implications of your findings overall for clinicians and CAM professionals? I think one of the um, implications may be to think more specifically about how can we target, how can we add uh, a module in order to address this trait feature in young girls, but probably also in young boys with anorexia nervosa, mm -hmm. and um, to follow, follow up studies also where we use the usual approach as, for example, the FBT, and, and then also add modules that address specifically the um, perfectionism. I, I would also be very interested in the socially prescribed perfectionism, especially in terms of onset of the disorder, because um, probably that uh, plays an important role. That's something that we haven't been able to look at in this study. So, so are you thinking about things like school-based interventions for that? 
maybe to start with, to define its role. Because um, what we see in the clinic is that socially prescribed perfectionism plays a big role for everything that is in, linked to social media and social um, networks. We hear people expressing also this a way into the disorder um, that quite has changed in the last years, where more and more um, it is put forward also um, the exposure to social media. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really a, a very good example of, of a socially prescribed um, perfectionism. And, and do you think clinicians and CAM professionals take in that factor about perfectionism in, in their, their current interventions? Until now, it is it is little systematized. I mean, there are, as I mentioned, also um, some small studies doing it, mm -hmm. but uh, the usual approaches uh, do it less so. Mm -hmm. um, there is EDI, so the most used inventory, inventory for uh, eating disorder. There is already a scale um, looking in those two types of perfectionism. So that's important. So the information is there, but it's not so easy to to address this, to target this uh, in your interventions. I mean, speaking of this, I, I think there would probably be a need also more broad than only in eating disorders to address the socially prescribed perfectionism in girls, because we see a drop in self-esteem in girls entering uh, puberty. And we see also these rising rates of crisis um, in, in young girls. So I think there is something to look at. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, just returning to the paper, Kirsten, is there anything else that you would like to highlight in the paper itself? The fact that um, when we use this EDI scale, because we also used it in, in our study, actually there was not a difference between the, the different groups that we have um, examined, uh, which poses some questions for us. So, so we couldn't really explain that very well. Yeah. Probably um, there is also a, a difference um, in age, maybe. That's that's an open question. Mm, so a lot more to, to research. Yeah. So, so are you planning any follow-up research or is there anything else in the pipeline? that you? Well, actually, what I just mentioned, um, mm. the, the socially prescribed per perfectionism in the onset of um, eating disorder, that's really uh, a topic that is very important, and that we will try to address in the future. Mm, look forward to hearing about that. Finally, Kirsten, what is your take-home message for our listeners? Well, I, I think the take-home message is really that perfectionism um, seems to be a trait feature, at least uh, in young females suffering from anorexia nervosa, and also uh, for those who have recovered from it. And um, with this study, we cannot really... Um, determine whether it has an influence on the onset of the disorder, but it seems um, that exposure to perfect images of the other may also provoke an onset of the disorder, um, and that's something to follow up in the future. Kirsten, thank you ever so much. For more details on Professor Kirsten von Plessen, please visit the ACAM website, www.acam.org, and Twitter at ACAM. ACAM is spelt A-C-A-M-H. And don't forget to follow us on your preferred streaming platform. Let us know if you enjoyed the podcast with a rating or review and do share with friends and colleagues. 